be an exciting message. Tonight is do what you can do and then some. We need some and then some people. Amen. So say this with me together. My heart is open. My mind is ready. Make me better, God. And then some. We have been looking at the book of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And this is what it says. I am certain that God, who began a good work in you. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't think you really need to read any further than that to find the encouragement you need in your life. Because the Apostle Paul starts out and says, I am certain that God. He is certain that God, who is God? God, the creator of the universe, the architect of the universe, literally millions and millions of galaxies, let alone stars. The one who made this universe, he is certain that this God is going to complete something in your life. Just recently this year, scientists were gazing out into space and they saw something happen in space. Does anybody know? Does anybody watch the news? Does anybody know what happened in August? It actually didn't happen in August. They just saw it in August. It took 130 million years for the light to get here for the scientists to observe what happened. Way out in deep, deep space, two neutron stars collided in space. The God who could conceive of that is the one that Paul is talking about we can be certain of. Now when those neutron stars collided, they literally sent out shock waves in the gravitational force of the universe that hit planet Earth. Scientists developed a test, two long tunnels that fire a laser light in the tunnels. And as the gravitational wave from that collision, which happened way out in deep space, hit the earth, those little laser lights jiggled from the gravitational wave. Isn't that awesome? But it gets better. Do you know what happens when two neutron stars collide? When you look at the atomic chart, you see some elements that are heavy elements. They have a very dense nucleus full of neutrons and protons. Where do they come from? When neutron stars collide, you know what's made? Things like gold and platinum are made in a neutron. That's where they come from. Isn't that awesome? I think about that, and I think about the awesome, incredible God that we serve, and we can stand with certainty concerning His promises in our life. That I'll encourage you right there. A friend of mine, Pastor Brian Thompson, came back from a mission trip in Africa. And it was an incredibly successful mission trip. And when he came home, he was having dinner with his wife. And suddenly something happened to her face. And her face began to sag. She began to lose all the feeling in her face. And her vision began to go. And they rushed her to the hospital and found out that she had an enormous tumor in her brain. And the doctor said, we are going to have to get her into surgery as soon as possible. And he began to make the preparations for surgery. And Pastor Brian went home and he sat in his hot tub and he looked up at the universe that God had made. And he said, God, you created billions of stars and galaxies, a massive universe. The Bible says you hold it all in the span of your hand. God, if you could do all of that, you can take care of my wife. And a couple days later, the the doctor, when they talked, said, you know what? We think we should just wait a week before we do the surgery. And so they waited a week. And then they spoke to the doctor and he says, you know, I think we should wait one more week and run a few more tests. And then they ran a couple more tests and he says, you know, the tumor's not as big as it used to be. Let's wait two more weeks. And they ran some more tests and the tumor was smaller. And within a six-week period, that tumor disappeared. Why? Because God is bigger than your problem. You know, we got to sometimes stop our reading and think about the words that we're reading and understand what they mean. Paul says, I am certain that God, this God who breathes the universe into existence, this God who began a good work within you will continue that work. It doesn't matter the problem. It doesn't matter the setback. It doesn't matter the difficulty. This God is in control. He'll finish what He started in your life if you'll trust Him. Amen? He says he'll continue this work until it's finally finished. He's going to keep going until it's finally finished. Last week we talked about this little sentence, who began 
the good work within you. How does God begin the good work within you? How does that work start? It starts by the stirring of His Holy Spirit in your heart. He begins to trigger faith to believe. Before you knew Jesus, you were kind of clueless, right? And somebody introduced you to the gospel, and the Holy Spirit began to stir upon your heart faith to believe. The Bible says God's given all of us the measure of faith. All of us have the ability to respond to that moving of the Holy Spirit by faith. But you know what? That work doesn't begin until we step out and cross the starting line of that race to believe. Amen? The good work begins when we respond to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And the way it is in salvation is the same way it is in everything. You've got a difficulty in your marriage. The Holy Spirit will stir faith in you to believe God to heal your marriage. You've got a problem with your children. The Holy Spirit will stir faith in you to believe for that problem. You have a difficulty in your finances. The Holy Spirit will stir in you the faith to believe God. And you step out and you cross the line into that race. And you do what you can do in response. You know, faith always requires action, doesn't it? It's not real faith until you do something with it. Amen? If I have a debit card at the bank and I have a bank full of money, that debit card does me absolutely no good. I'm going to starve with that card in my pocket. I've got to put some action to that faith. I've got to take that card out and I've got to go to that debit machine and put it in and punch the pen. Have you ever been at the store and you pull out your card and you're not really sure if you've got enough money to cover the bill? You ever been there? You know, you have the grocery store line and, and you, you punch your number in, two, three, four, five. That's not my number, just saying. Two, three, four, five, and you're waiting to see if it'll say accepted or declined, right? And you ever had it come back declined? It's so embarrassing and you're like, okay, put the bananas back and put the chocolate chip cookies back, right? You know what I'm talking about? Well, guess what? That card is activated when you take action. It's the same way responding to God in faith. You've got to do something, amen? Well, I'm way off my notes, but it's good. He'll finish. Get this. He'll finish what we begin. If you don't begin, he won't finish it. you got to respond in faith to what he says and does in your life you got a relationship that needs healing. It's not going to heal by itself. you got to pick up the phone and say, Hi, Fred. Remember me. We haven't talked in 20 years. That's your little brother, Mark. I don't have a brother named Fred, so don't worry about it. I talk to my brother all the time. Just saying. He'll finish what you begin. You've got to cross the line and start the race. Amen? We said this last week. When you do what you can do, he'll do what he can do. Or we could turn that around and we could say it this way. He will not do what he can do until you do what you can do. you got to take action on your faith. Well, guys, that was last week. Say it gets better. You guys aren't convinced. Say it gets better. This week... Do what you can do and then some. We're going to talk about this little idea called the extra mile. But in order to set this up, we're going to go back to a story in the Old Testament about a person who was always doing the extra, the and then some. Her name is Rebecca. Abraham has been called by God from his hometown He's traveled across the desert. He's settled in Canaan land. God has promised that his family will inherit this land, that his descendants will be as great as the number of stars in the sky and the sand on the sea. They'll be uncountable. Abraham's getting old, and his son is growing up, and he's facing those years where you know you're going to pass on, and his son still hasn't found the woman of his dreams, and Abraham starts to get worried. So he calls his servant, and he says, Servant, we've got a problem here. I'm not going to live much longer, and my son needs a wife, and I want you to go find the woman for my son. 
Who thinks that would be a little bit of a heavy responsibility? You know what I'm talking about? We're talking about the guy who God has given his covenant to, whose seed is going to bless the whole earth, and he's saying, go find me the woman for my son. This is the woman who's going to carry the seed that ultimately brings the Messiah to earth. Amen? There's a big responsibility. And so Abraham makes his servant promise that he'll go to his hometown, that he'll only bring a wife from his hometown. So off goes the servant. He loads up the camels. He travels across the desert. And he arrives at Abraham's hometown. And he's feeling the pressure. You know what I'm saying? He's got to deliver now. This is what he says. Oh, Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success today. Show unfailing love to my master. See, I'm standing here beside this spring, and the young women of the town are coming out to draw water. This is my request. I'll ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. If she says, yes, have a drink, and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one you've selected for Isaac's wife. And this is how I'll know that you've shown unfailing love to my master. Before he finished praying, he opened his eyes. Can you believe that? I mean, right there. How, how could he open his eyes before he finished praying? My kids do that at the dinner table. They're eyeing the food, and they're getting ready to grab. You know, as soon as the amen goes, they're going to, you know, anyways. He opens, I'm just kidding with you guys. Have a sense of humor tonight. Before he finished praying, he opened his eyes and he's like, oh my goodness, look at that girl coming out of the city gate. She's gorgeous. She's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And he's going, wow, this has got to be the one for Isaac. She is so beautiful. And so he saw Rebecca coming with the water jug on her shoulder. Now he doesn't know this, but she's the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Abraham's brother Nahor, right from Abraham's family. She was very beautiful and old enough to be married and still a virgin. She went down to the spring. She filled her jug. She came up again. Running over to her, the servant said, Please, give me a little drink of water from your jug. Man, this guy is hot. He is thirsty. He is stinky. He is dirty. He goes up to this beautiful young woman and says, Please, could I have a glass of water? I remember going hiking with my friend from England and his name was Huey Bryson, and he'd say, we'd be out hiking, and he'd be thirsty. He'd go, water. I need water. I always think of that when I read this. I need water. Yes, my Lord, she answered. Have a drink. And she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. And when she'd given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they've had enough to drink. So, watch this. She quickly emptied her jug into the water trough. She's not wasting any time here. She ran back to the well to draw water for his camels. The servant watched in silence, wondering whether or not the Lord had given him success in his mission. Then at last, this took a while. We'll get into that in a minute. At last, when the camels had finished drinking, he took out a gold ring for her nose and two large gold bracelets for her wrists. I want to say this about this story. It was the custom of that day in the Middle East to show kindness to strangers. It was unthinkable that she would have denied his request for a glass of water. When he came up to her and said, water, I need water. Like, there's no way she was going to say no, because that would be the rudest of the rudest of the rude things you could possibly do to someone in the Middle East. It was the custom of the day. It was what was expected of her. I just want to point this out. A thirsty man can drink a liter of water or maybe two. That's not a lot. She's got a jug on her shoulder. It's probably maybe two and a half to three gallons, maybe 18 to 20 liters. And she gives this man a liter or two of water. Not a big deal. Just doing what's expected. But then she goes on to do something extraordinary she does, does what Jesus would have called going the extra mile. Amen? She offers to water his camels as well. Now, maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal to you. Maybe you're used to riding horses. I don't know. But a camel can drink a lot of water. Does anybody here actually know how much water a camel can drink? A camel could 
I know, I know, I know this. I'm going to tease you guys for a little bit first, though. A camel could literally go 100 miles through the desert without drinking. That's a long ways through the hot, dry, dusty, dirty desert. 100 miles, no problem for a camel without water. In fact, a camel can go 10 days without a glass of water. You won't make it three. If you don't get water, it's Sunday night. If you don't have water Wednesday, you're dead. That's it. You're done. Kaput. You need water every day to live, right? Next to air, the next thing you need is water. But a camel can literally store so much water in its body, it can go 10 days without water. The camels that he probably had in that day would have drank. They just finished crossing the desert. They're dry. They're hot. They're stinky. They're exhausted. They would have drank 135 to 200 liters of water each. Now read the text. This is the kind of girl Rebecca is. She's an and then some girl, right? She doesn't just do the minimum. She doesn't just do enough to get by. She doesn't just do what's expected of her. She sees this man hot and thirsty and dry. And she's like, man, this guy has just come across the desert. He is so tired. He just needs to sit in the shade and I'll take care of his camels for him. And the Bible says, look at this. It says she runs quickly. She quickly emptied her jug, and she ran to the water trough and ran back and forth. And the servant is sitting there in the shade, watching in silence as she runs back and forth. Here's this girl. I mean, she's going over to the well, and she's dipping that jug in there, and she's pulling out 18 to 20 liters. We're talking 40 pounds. And she's pulling 40 pounds of water out of the well, and she's running to the trough, and she's emptying it, and she's going back. We're talking 60 or 70 trips from the well to the trough. We're talking easy an hour and a half. This girl was not only gorgeous, She was buff, man. She was in good shape. She was stacked. She was ready to go. You know what I'm talking about? She's in good shape. I was talking about her muscles. You guys, keep it clean over here. She goes on to do the extraordinary. Probably 1,300, 1,400, 1,500 liters of water to fill those camels. Now, she does not know who this man is, does she? As far as she knows, he's just another merchant wandering through the desert from city to city selling his wares. The Bible actually tells us earlier in the text he has ten camels, by the way, and they are loaded with booty. Yeah, yeah. Abraham says to his servant, I want you to get ten camels, load them with gifts for the wife of my son. They're filled with clothes. I'm talking 30, 40, 50 pairs of shoes. I'm talking outfits. I'm talking gold and jewelry and silver. I mean, it's loaded. Ten camels full of booty. Does anybody know how much a camel can carry? Or do you want to know? Yeah, 800 to 1,000 pounds. This is what he brought as the gift. She doesn't know any of this. She just thinks he's a traveling salesman who's worn out and hot and tired. And she's thinking, I'm just going to help this guy get some water. She doesn't know that this is the Middle Eastern version of Prince Charming. This guy is the heir apparent to one of the largest estates in the Middle East. In fact, Abraham has become one of the richest men in his time. He is loaded with horses and camels and donkeys and goats and sheep and gold and silver and servants. He's built up a huge estate he is so blessed and he is gonna look for the wife of the heir to this grand estate she doesn't know any of that she's just being who she is that person who goes the extra mile that person who always gives the little bit extra that person who's always really really willing and ready to be the and then some person She doesn't know what's about to happen. She just knows she's been inconvenienced by this stranger in need, and she's got the ability to help. She's not trying to impress him. She's not a gold digger. This is just who she is. She does what's expected, and then some. She'd have done it for anyone. 
She's not a minimum effort person. She's not just doing enough to get by. She's not just thinking, how little can I get away with? No, she goes the extra mile in every situation. This is what Jesus said. This is how he wants us as his followers to be. Matthew chapter 5, 41. He said, if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Now, Jesus actually uses an odd word for demand. Sometimes it's translated demand. Sometimes it's translated compel. It's actually a word that comes from the Persian language. King Cyrus of Persia had a huge empire built and he would need to send messages out to the farthest reaches of his empire so he would send out his messengers on horseback and if the horse was worn out or exhausted or thirsty or died or was crippled or whatever that messenger could compel anyone to take him he could commandeer the next horse. He could take a boat. He could take a ship. He could take a cart. He could compel anyone to carry the king's message. Do you know when we go the extra mile in our lives, when we lay down our lives to serve people who maybe don't deserve it, when we do more than what's expected, we're actually carrying the king's message to our world by how we live. And then some. The word mile that he uses is a Roman word. And that's a different word. That word talked about the distance that a man would travel. I believe it's 1,500 steps. But he again uses language that helps us contextualize and understand what he's saying. The Romans in his day were not loved people. They were not liked by the Jewish people. They were there domineering them and holding them in bondage to their system to their empire. They had come and they had dominated the land. And Jesus says to these people who are the least deserving of your time and of your effort, go the extra mile. When they compel you, they force you to take the bag one mile. Now they had a custom in that day that any Roman soldier could command a civilian person to carry their gear for a mile. That was a custom. If you didn't do it, they'd beat you. So you didn't really have a choice to go that first mile. But Jesus says, go the second mile willingly. Be an extra mile person. I don't know about you, but I think we need some extra mile Christians. Amen. That's the kind of people we ought to be. That's how we ought to live. You know, there's not a lot of traffic on the extra mile. It's not a very busy road. Not that many people travel it. You're not going to encounter any traffic jams on that mile. But I want to say this, the blessing is in the extra mile. When you just do what's expected, when you just do what you have to, when you just do enough to get by and not anymore, there's no blessing there. The blessing is in when you go the extra mile. When you do what's expected, and then some. When you give what's expected, and then some. Amen? I like to say it this way. You can't get maximum blessing with minimum effort. You're going to get maximum blessing with maximum effort. We ought to be the kind of people who are always willing to do a little extra, go a little beyond. Amen? Rebecca's an end, then some person. She offers the customary hospitality. She gives a stranger a drink, but she goes beyond what's expected of her and does more. He's hot and tired. She doesn't have to. But this is who she is. She doesn't know that the treasure he's carrying is going to be for the woman who will water the camels. We read the story and we know that's going to happen, but she doesn't know that. When's the last time you just did someone without any expectation of anything in return? When's the last time you gave extra at your work? without demanding extra in, your, in return for it? When's the last time you gave extra in your marriage, not expecting anything extra in return for it? Be an and then some person. Don't just give what's required. Go the extra mile, because that's where the blessing is. She's chosen by God because of her character. She's going to become the matriarch of a great nation. In fact, her descendants will be as numerous as the sand on the shores of the sea. She'll be in the lineage of Christ, and ultimately the Messiah will come through her because she goes the extra mile. Amen? I think 
We need some and then some Christians. You know, when you move into the area of sacrifice, that's where the blessing is. When you read the Old Testament, you'll find when the people would come together and they would go beyond what was required with extravagant sacrifice, the fire of God would fall. You see, when they built the temple and they gave far beyond what was required, they extravagantly gave and sacrificed for God. We see the presence of God falling. We see the blessing of God in those places. Amen? You know, a lot of Christians think, I'm just going to do as little as I can to get by and make it into heaven, you know? They kind of come to church and they do their little thing on Sunday and they offer their little token to God. But they're just trying to get by rather than really being an and some believer, giving God their all. You know, the Bible talks about tithing, and I believe there's a principle in tithing that we give to God 10% of all that he's given to us. It's a, it's a covenant relationship with God. As I give to God back what he's given to me, his blessing and his favor and his protection comes on my life. But you know what? The Bible says when we tithe, we're simply returning to God what's already his. Generosity is what you do next generosity is the extra mile generosity is and then some amen we need to go beyond just tithing that's a great place to start but we need to go beyond that you know in the workplace today there's a philosophy in our workplace and i'm sure many of you experience it where you work and it kind of goes like this i'm going to do the least expected and get the most for it i want benefits i want my insurance I want less hours. I want easier work. I want a nicer boss. I want fret, hot, fresh hot coffee. I want donuts in the coffee room. I mean, we want it all, right? But we want to give the minimum effort for it and get the maximum reward. I want to encourage you this. If you work for somebody else, be an and then some employee. Be that employee who shows up work, who stays late, who does the, does the ugly job nobody else wants to do. You know what I'm talking about? The, the job that everybody else kind of ignores and pretends isn't there. You'd be the one who says, hey, I'll go do that. I'll go do that job. Be an and then some employee. I think that as Christians, as followers of Christ, we ought to be in high demand for our attitudes at work. If you got a complaining attitude at work, you got a minimum effort attitude at work. You're not honoring Jesus. In fact, you're being disobedient to what he said you should be. You should be the best, hardest working, best attitude employee there is. When I was 19 years old, I moved to the city, and I went to the great corporation of McDonald's for a job. I did. I rode my bike around McDonald's seven times. I was like the city of Jericho. I said, you're going to hire me, and you can't say no. That's what I said. And they said, we're not hiring. And I said, that doesn't matter. I'll see you tomorrow. And I rode my bike. I had a pedal bike. I rode it around that McDonald's, and I prayed for that job because I was going to Bible school, and I needed a place that was open at night, and they were the only one that I could get to on my bicycle. And I rode around that place seven times for seven days, and I went there and said, are you going to hire me? And they said, I guess we'll have to. Like, because you won't leave us alone. So they hired me. And then I'd ride my bike to work every day. It's kind of, kind, of sounds, kind of sounds silly. I'd ride my bike to work every night and say, God bless McDonald's. God, just bless that whole corporation. I'm so thankful for them that they gave me a job. I'm so excited about this opportunity to work, God. Let me be the best employee for these people. I'm telling you, nobody could flip a burger like I could. You know what I'm talking about? Fast, perfect, on the ball every time. The other people at McDonald's, they didn't get that attitude at all. They're like, what is wrong with Mark? Why does he always work so hard? Why is he always so nice to the bosses? Why does he always do everything they ask? And I pray, God, bless that whole corporation. Let them have the best quarter they've ever had in their history because they gave me a job, and I carry the blessing of God with me, and I appreciate this work. I didn't complain about working at McDonald's. I loved it. When I told them I was going to move, they said, please don't move. Please don't move. Would you stay? Would you, would you join our management program? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm really happy for this job for a year, but this is not my dream. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but they begged me to stay. I'm telling you, the extra mile, there's not a lot of traffic on it. You want promotion. You want advancement. You want God to bless you. Get on the extra mile. You'll rise to the top because nobody else is on the extra mile. I'm telling you, I moved up to bigger and better things. I moved from McDonald's to Red Lobster. Now I was in the big league. You know what I'm talking about? I didn't give them a choice about hiring me either. They were close to the new Bible school I was going to, and I'm like, you're going to have to hire me. 
because it's the only place I can work and still get to my Bible school, right? So they hired me, and I went there every day, and I said, God, I'm going to be the best employee. I'm going to work harder than anyone else has ever worked here. You know when Oral Roberts came to Dallas and pulled off the LBJ freeway for some popcorn shrimp? He came to my Red Lobster, and I served him. He has very large ears, I'm just saying. But I served him. When General Mills bought Red Lobster, and the, the boss of General Mills came to Dallas and went to the Red Lobster to check out the new chain of restaurants he bought, guess who served him? I did. I blessed that business every day I went there. I was always so thankful for it. we got to be thankful. Be thankful for your work. Be a good employee. I'm telling you, you're in the king's business. Amen? Do the dirty jobs. Give the extra effort. Don't whine. Don't complain. Be willing. Be an and then some employee. Do what others won't do. Not just when the boss is looking. He knows. You know, you put on a good show. Every time he comes around, he knows. Yeah, he knows exactly what you're doing. There's a name for the color of your nose. We'll get into that later. Rebecca went the extra mile and then some. You know, extra effort brings extra reward. You want God's blessing to increase in your life? Do what you can do and then some. I discovered this early on in my marriage. My wife would be struggling to keep the house together and kids all over the place. And I'd come home and the house would be a mess. And I'm like, honey, let me just take care of this. Let me just cook the dinner. Let me just clean. Let me just finish that laundry for you. Honey, you go get yourself a pedicure and a manicure, honey. You just go relax and enjoy yourself. And I'm telling you, I'd, she'd come back and I'd have that house clean. I'd have those kids fed. I'd clean the toilets for her. I got to tell you, extra effort brings extra reward. That may be why we have five children today. I don't know. I'm telling you, a good marriage is not 50-50. A good marriage is and then some. Marriages don't end in divorce because mates are doing extra for each other. You know what I'm talking about? Marriages don't go to divorce because people are going the extra mile. Marriages end up in divorce because somebody is sitting on their lazy rear end and going, I'm not getting what I need out of this marriage. Stop it! You ought to be giving and then some. Guys, you want to be the head of your home? i got news for you. It takes more than a zipper on your pants to make you the head of your home. You know what I'm talking about? Ed Cole said, you're male by birth, you're man by choice. And manhood means I take responsibility for my marriage, for my family, for my children, for my resources, because that's what a man does and then some. Do what you can do, and then some. When you give everything you've got, especially to an ugly situation, and there's some of you here tonight, you got some ugly situations in your life. Maybe you got a difficult job. Maybe you're working for that boss that I had who would come downstairs from his office, and, and if you were in his way, you got it. You know that boss? Yeah, I worked for that boss. I blessed him too. I appreciated the job he gave me. And I honored him. But I know what that's like. Maybe you're in a relationship that's tough and difficult right now. When you give everything you've got and then some to an ugly situation, I believe God will make something beautiful out of it. What you think is your problem... What you think is your trouble actually might be your gateway. That low-paying, dead-end job that you're slaving at, it actually might be the gateway to the blessing that God has for you if you'll serve it. Amen? You know, Rebecca could have complained. Why did he have to have ten camels? Couldn't he had five? I mean, three of those camels are hardly carrying any weight. And She could have huffed and puffed and watered the camels and got three watered and got four watered. And she could have sat down and said, ten camels. Who travels with ten camels anyway? Arr. She could have done it. She didn't. She ran. She fed, watered the camels. She did it with a great attitude and heart, right? 
If you're on the extra mile with a bad attitude, you're missing the opportunity for great blessing. You might as well pull over at the rest stop. Get your attitude fixed and then get back on the extra mile. Amen? Your problem might actually be your gateway because out of those camels came the blessing. The next day she rode that camel to her destiny. Amen? That situation you're in right now, go the extra mile. Honor God with it. And let God make something beautiful out of your challenge. Amen? Don't complain about your situation. Man, when I was a kid, I could have complained that McDonald's was the only place I could have worked. I could have said, man, who put this Bible school here anyways? Why didn't they put this Bible school next to some cool jobs? You know what I'm talking about? No, I was grateful. I was thankful. Had the right attitude. Those camels were her blessing. They were carrying great riches and blessing for her. And you know what will happen in your life too? That ugly situation, hard, difficult, job nobody appreciates you, dead end, it might be your gateway to greatness. Be an extra mile person. Do what you can do and then some. Give everything you've got and then some. Right where you are in your job, in your marriage, in whatever situation God's put you in. And watch. I challenge you, watch what God will do. He'll turn it around for good. He'll make something beautiful. He'll bless your extra mile. You do what you can do, and then some. And God will do what he can do. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. God, I thank you that you challenge us to be and then some people. People who would go the extra mile. People who would give extravagantly. People who would serve willingly. People who would not complain or gripe or have negative attitudes, but people who would always do what's expected and then some. And Lord, I ask tonight that your Holy Spirit would be here to challenge us and encourage us and convict us in our own lives, God. Lord, there's so many areas in my life where it's so easy to have the wrong attitude and complain. And God, bring that convicting work of your Holy Spirit to each one of us tonight. Challenge us how you would have us change and grow so that you can turn our situations into blessing God. In Jesus' name. You might be here tonight. You might be watching online later on. I don't know. But if you're one of those people that you've never fully crossed the line of faith to trust in Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to do that tonight. It's the greatest decision that you can make to trust in Him. You know, so many people are trying to live their lives balancing the good with the bad and hoping that they can make enough effort to do enough good to make things right. The truth is you can't. But Jesus can. He's already made it right for you. Some of you, you've crossed that line of faith to begin to trust in Him, but you haven't really fully given yourself to it. Some of you have approached the line of faith and hesitated and wondered about making that step. I want to offer you an opportunity to pray with me tonight to enter that race by putting your complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ tonight. You know, the Bible says that all of us are appointed to die once and then we'll face judgment. And our lives will be opened up before God and weighed. The only way to escape that judgment is through the sacrifice that Jesus made. That he gave his perfect life in the place of our sinful lives. And it's up to you to make that choice, to put your trust in him. No one else can do that for you. Amen. So if we could just close our eyes here for a moment. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to work upon every heart. Those watching online, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to work upon your hearts. I'm going to ask you to make a step of faith to simply lift your hand. It's not for me to say anything. I'm not going to call you up, but it's, this is between you and God. To raise your hand as an act of faith and say, God, I'm responding. I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you in this room and online, lift your hands. One, two, three. God sees that hand. He sees your heart. Amen. Let's all pray this prayer together. Let's say, Heavenly Father, Tonight I'm making a choice to cross the starting line of faith 
to put my complete trust in You, holding nothing back. I ask that You'd forgive me for my sin, that You would make me right with God, that You would be a part of my life, live in me, and help me to follow You every day. In Jesus' name, Amen.